Thank you everybody for joining in for this webinar on reworkability of gap fillers in electric vehicle battery packs, which we have titled as the right amount of force. I am Anurodh Tripathi, as Chris mentioned. I am a senior scientist at Parker Lord Corporation in the Advanced Chemical Technology Group, focusing mainly on the thermal management solutions in the electric vehicles. So in this presentation, we will cover um, what exactly reworkability means and what impact it has on the aftermarket solutions for electric vehicle battery repair. Uh, I will go into the details of how do we actually quantify reworkability uh, by using pull-off stress or pull-off force. Uh, then I will go into how this pull-off stress changes with uh, the surface that you are using for application of gap filler or what is the measurement technique and I will end the presentation with some of the considerations that uh, we as an industry can take to probably solve this uh, issue of reworkability of uh, battery packs. So before I move forward, uh, I just want to highlight this information. We will be live tweeting this uh, webinar. And um, if you want to join in the conversation, use this hashtag charged webinar to share your comments, insight. Um, you can tag at Lord Corporation uh, if you have any comments. So before I move forward into the presentation, I wanted to introduce to us about uh, Parker. So last year in October, we were acquired by Parker. And Parker is a $14 billion company with more than 3,000 product lines and has close to half a million customers worldwide. The team members include uh, more than 56,000 members. And we have a global presence, uh, encompassing more than um, 1,000 markets. And we are in uh, 50 countries and 290 manufacturing sites. We are excited to be part of Parker. And our commitment to serve and innovate with our customers remains unchanged. So who is Parker Lord? Um, if you don't know, if you haven't worked with us in the past, uh, the best way to describe us is your collaborative partner. As I mentioned before that we will try our best to deliver solutions designed to meet your specific needs, um, to improve your uh, con process uh, uh, conditions, and so that you can meet your cost targets. And to achieve that, uh, we have our teams worldwide. We are globally supported. Uh, we have global manufacturing capabilities uh, and the team strive towards consistency and quality. And this commitment to customers is why our products are in all, almost every car in the world. The thermal management portfolio of uh, Parker Lord has manufacturing locations in North America, South America, uh, Europe and Asia. Uh, so we are willing to serve customers in every part of the world. Lot products go into almost every area of the vehicle. Uh, we have adhesives, we have um, gaff fillers uh, that go into almost every um, locations of the car. This, uh, if, if you have any questions regarding that, any queries, you can uh, talk to me. You can message me. If I don't know, I'll uh, connect you to the right person. This presentation, I'll be talk, uh, talking mainly about the uh, gap fillers and the battery packs and battery modules. So jumping right into reworkability, what is reworkability and why we should care about it? So the definition of a reworkability can be, def in terms of the gap filler, can be defined as to effectively remove a battery module, uh, reapply the gap filler and repair it. To define what are packs, modules, and cells, this is an illustration of a battery pack. The green in here uh, defines a battery pack that is comprised of this uh, blue battery modules. And these battery modules are themselves comprised of these uh, pink illustrated cells. Uh, these battery modules are uh, attached to the cooling plate at the bottom using a gas filler or a thermal in interface material. 
now when we compare uh, in, internal combustion engines um, normal cars versus electronic vehicles the biggest difference is their powertrain the most expensive part in an ev is its battery pack uh, which can account to as high as 40% of the cost of electric vehicle so if you um, uh, want to think about it the uh, replacing an entire battery pack could be a very costly affair and if if we talk about the challenges associated to to do that um customers usually need a material that is liquid which means it's highly wetting so that it um, uh, eliminates all any air gaps that could be in between uh, these uh, battery modules and the cooling plate so that there is an effective heat transfer but if that is the case which means that uh, the uh, the battery module and the battery pack should pass all the environmental testing all the reliability testing and that implies that it should not come out but then we want to do uh, reworkability or when we want to repair it then we also want it to come out really easily so there there is this kind of uh, dichotomy over there that you want to uh, manage so there is a balancing act now the question the second question comes is how this reworkability will be done that is cost effective would we send the cars to oems would it go to a local auto body sh shop and that is a question that we as an industry have to answer collectively so i, I alluded a little bit about the cost uh, of the uh, reworkability and i want to spend a little bit more time about why we should care about reworkability uh, one straightforward answer is environment uh, we want to save the environment we want to have a sustainable solution so if imagine that you have this entire battery pack and you are throwing it away every time when there is a single module that is faulty then you are not only increasing the cost of the entire operation but also you are um, being environmentally unfriendly so we want to address that by um, by having a reworkable solution that can go back into this uh, circular economy and as far as the cost is considered um, if we do a quick calculation um, in 2019 there were 2.1 million evs in the market if we assume a modest 1% failure failure rate uh, there will be 21000 electric vehicles with issues and if we say that um, we are replacing an entire battery pack versus one faulty module then that difference could be approximately 200 million dollars per year which is a huge cost and that behooves us that we should focus more on the reworkability issue apart from that the other uh, reason could be this emerging market in uh, mainly china and india where uh, the charging stations are not readily available so there this uh, battery swapping technique has been uh, uh, looked into a uh, neo has completed its uh, 500000 uh swap uh, earlier this year so what 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 the idea is that uh, you go into a shop uh, your battery is discharged um, you take your entire battery pack uh, and replace it with a already charged battery pack so now these battery packs if there is some module that is faulty the battery needs to be swapped it means that these these battery packs should have reworkable battery modules so that's uh, one other reason to look into reworkability so let's jump into the data right away the biggest question is that how do we quantify reworkability and to answer that let's go into that uh, figure again so this is the battery module shown um coming out from a battery pack what we need is to remove this module and replace it with a with a new module and if i make a 2d diagram out of this uh, we have a battery module and then there are neighboring modules uh, a battery length l height h and the spacing between a neighboring module or spacing between two battery modules let's call it w now there are two ways we can remove this either we uh, pull the battery from the edge which we can call edge pull off or the more common approach is this vertical pull off where we vertically uh, remove the battery parallel to the cooling plate 
And why this is common is because usually this W, the spacing between battery modules is very small. So that doesn't allow for the battery to be removed from the edge. It will hiss, hit the neighboring module before it even uh, moves slightly. So the uh, testing method that we used to test that vertical pull-off is, is as follows. We apply a gap filler between two uh, T aluminum T-bars uh, and have a spacer in between. Uh, allow the gap filler to cure and then we pull these two apart and measure the maximum force required to pull these apart. If we divide that force by the area at which this uh, gap filler by apply was applied, that is called pull-off stress. And for all this testing, we have used one inch by one inch area. So the area is constant. I want to put uh, numbers in perspective. So uh, we will have different values of this pull-off force uh, or pull-off stress, um, usually in terms of the megapascals for pull-off stress, because force is divided by area. A usual battery pack um, can be approximated as the size of a shoebox. That is, uh, let's say, 30 centimeter in length and 20 centimeter in width. So um, if I have a pull-off stress of 0.1 megapascal and I divide by this cross, or sorry, multiplied by this cross-section area, that gives me a force of 3,600 newtons. Or in kilogram force, divided by acceleration is 367 kilogram force. That is equivalent to lifting a full, full grown horse. And you can imagine that if it's a 0.5 megapascal, one megapascal, that is like lifting uh, five horses or 10 horses, which is not an easy task. And if that much force is applied, there, is, there are high chances that the cooling plate may, be, may become uh, bent or faulty, or even a, a neighboring modules may suffer some damage. So there, there is a... Uh, that's why we'll have to look into uh, materials that show lower uh, pull -off, vertical pull-off stress to allow for reworkability. I want to talk about the failure modes um, because there are different definitions out there for the failure modes. Um, adhesive industry might have different definitions. So just for the consistency in this presentation, uh, what I'm using is as follows. Uh, adhesive uh, failure mode is defined as when the material is completely clean on one side of the um, T-bar, that is adhesive failure mode. Cohesive failure mode, when the material is present on both sides of the T-bar, as seen in this image. And the mixed mode is somewhere in between, where some of the area in one side of the T-bar is clean, but the material is stuck to uh, some, some uh, area. So that's the mixed mode. In this study, uh, these are the parameters uh, that I uh, used for uh, testing the vertical pull-off force. Uh, the material was one of our Cool Thumb products. Um, I'm calling that Cool Thumb A. Uh, it was kept constant across the study. Uh, the cure temperature was room temperature, cure time was three days, and cure hardness was also kept constant because it's, it was the same material. Uh, the things that I varied was uh, pull rate or the strain rate at which the T-bars are pulled. Uh, the surface, uh, which was uh, mostly aluminum, but it was varied. And I'll uh, mention that when it was varied. The surface roughness was varied deliberately. Uh, bond line thickness was also varied from one millimeter to different. And the pull direction, even though it was mostly vertical in all the studies, uh, at the very end, I'll talk about um, how the vertical pull-off changes when the pull direction is altered. So looking at the surface effects, the first thing is the surface roughness. Now, intuitively thinking, we will know that if uh, the surface is rough and we have a liquid material that wets uh, thoroughly the rough surface, it will go into the nooks and the crannies of the surface, thus making a very good uh, bond on the surface. So we expect that a rough surface would probably have a higher uh, stress or a higher force to remove. And that's what we ex see in this graph. So this graph is a box plot, um, which on the y-axis has a pull-off stress, a normalized value. And on the x-axis are the different materials or the different surface that were tested. Uh, orange is the fresh aluminum, blue is the uh, sandblasted aluminum. 
And uh, the box plot is, uh, those of you who don't know, is uh, uh, cont it contains all the data. So you have this uh, lower value or the minimum value, then the first quartile, the mean, median, 75th uh, person quartile, and the maximum value in that data set. And the lines that you see over here, uh, they demonstrate a uh, change in the mean pull off, vertical pull off value. So a red indicates an increase in the mean pull off. So over here, 17% increase, and a green increase a decrease in the vertical pull off. So over here, what you see is a rough surface uh, when the aluminum surface was deliberately, deliberately sandblasted. The average surface roughness measured by the surf test using an ASTM ISO standard was uh, increased almost 10 times. And that considerably increased the, the vertical pull off, uh, the mean pull off increased 17%. And this is a statistically significant difference if I compare it using the, a paired uh, T test. As far as the, the failure mode goes, the fresh aluminum had a failure mode of uh, mostly adhesive with some uh, samples that has mixed uh, failure. However, when it was sandblasted, the failure mode was mostly cohesive. Now, going deeper into the surface, surface effects, one might ask that, uh, let's say I had my battery module changed and it became faulty again and I, I need to change again. Then the question would arise that if the, if the new gap filler was applied, how would the vertical pull off change if I want to remove that same module again? So what we did was we took the same uh, coupons, same T-bars, and removed the gap filler on them just by using dry Kim wipe, and hence it's called surface dry cleaned. And the material was then applied, uh, the new gap filler was applied on that same surface, and the vertical pull-off test was done. And what we see over here is a 4% increase in the mean pull-off, uh, mean vertical pull-off, but that's not very statistically significant. So we would say that it doesn't change much in this particular case. However, the failure mode switches from adhesive and mixed failure mode to uh, mostly towards mixed failure mode. Uh, looking deeper into the surface, surface effects, some of the uh, customers use E-coated surfaces. So in this particular case, uh, aluminum was E-coated a fresh aluminum was e-coated. And we looked at how the vertical pull-off changes. Uh, what we noticed was a modest increase in, a, in the mean pull, vertical mean pull-off by 7%. Um, so going from aluminum to e-coat surface, we see a 7% increase in the mean pull-off stress, but that mean pull-off stress is statistically insignificant. Uh, there was also a change noticed in the failure mode where that adhesive slash mixed failure mode changed to cohesive failure mode. So the next thing we wanted to look was the effect of testing conditions. Uh, what happens when the pull rate is change, changed or the strain rate is changed? So what we did here was uh, change the pull rate from one millimeter per minute to 50 millimeter per minute and kept the uh, bond line thickness and everything else same. The surface was fresh aluminum. Uh, what we noticed was the pull of stress increases significantly moving from one millimeter per minute to 12 millimeter per minute. Uh, but after that, it was kind of uh, constant. It did not, it did not uh, vary much. Um, as far as the failure mode goes, the failure mode changed quite considerably. So at one millimeter per minute, it was a mostly cohesive failure with occasional mixed failure mode. Um, at and above 12 millimeter per minute, it started transitioning toward, towards adhesive failure and with some mixed failure modes. When we look into the bond line thickness um, to look into how the pull-off stress changes with the bond line, um, if we move from one millimeter to three millimeter bond line thickness, it pull off stress decreases uh, quite considerably, as can be seen over here uh, by reduction in the 28% when you move from one to two millimeter and further 18% when you move from two millimeter to three millimeter. And as far as the failure uh, mode goes, uh, at one millimeter, it was mostly mixed and adhesive as you have seen before. Uh, but at and above two millimeter, everything was adhesive failure. 
So now we wanted to actually compare some of our commercial gap fillers of our uh, cool therm portfolio. So we chose uh, some, uh, five of them, which are listed over here. Uh, cool Therm A has a thermal conductivity of 3.5, uh, measured from ISO test, uh, density of 3.3, hardness 80, and all the silicones ones that are first four, they had less than 100 ppm cyclic siloxane content. Uh, cool Therm B, it was a slightly lower than uh, Cool Therm A in terms of thermal conductivity of 3.0. Density was considerably lower at 2.4 grams per cc, and hardness was lower at 70 uh, show double O. Uh, cool thumb C and D are two watt per meter Kelvin. However, cool thumb D is much lower in density at uh, close to two gram per cc as compared to cool thumb C that is 2.9 gram per cc. Uh, but cool thumb D is lower in terms of its hardness that is show double O 60 as compared to cool thumb C that is show double O 80. We also have a non-silicone uh, material that is cool thumb E, uh, 2.0 watt per meter Kelvin, a density of 2.65 and a hardness of show double O 75. Uh, you can learn more about these products by going on this link and we have other products there too. Uh, we compare the pull-off force, uh, pull-off stress for our cool thumb gap fillers and uh, the normalized pull-off stress versus different cool thumb products that we uh, just mentioned are listed over here. As you can see that cool thumb B is close to 30% lower in pull-off stress as compared to cool thumb A and cool thumb D is uh, close to 60% lower in pull-off stress as compared to cool thumb D. Uh, cool thumb E is uh, some of a hybrid in between, which is, it is a non-silicone product. Um, so we have a wide variety of products to serve your needs, depending on what are your requirements. Along with just tailoring pull-off stress, we can tailor uh, different other properties of a gap filler as required by the customer. As far as the failure mode goes, uh, Cool Thumb A, as it was mentioned before, is mix and adhesive. Cool Thumb B is mostly mixed failure mode. Cool Thumb C, that uh, is an adhesive failure mode, whereas Cool Thumb D is again a mixed failure mode. Cool Thumb E, a non silicon product, is a cohesive failure mode. At this point, I would like to uh, mention something about uh, what as an industry as a whole, we can uh, work towards to uh, allow for reworkability by reducing the vertical pull-off force of removing these battery modules from a pack. So initially I mentioned that pulling the battery from the edge won't be uh, very easy in very tightly packed modules in a battery pack. So as this uh, slide shows, uh, we can reduce the pull-off stress quite considerably by changing the pull location. Um, again, pull-off stress normalized versus uh, different um, pull locations. As you can see, there is a 56% decrease in the pull-off stress when the same sample, cool thumb A, was pulled from an edge as compared to when it was pulled from the center. And all the other conditions were kept constant as if the, uh, the ball line thickness was kept at one millimeter, the pull rate was at 12 millimeter per minute, um, the only difference was the pull location. Uh, as far as the failure mode goes, the mix and adhesive failure mode of cool thumb A while pulling from the center changes to completely adhesive when pulling from an edge. Uh, so that, that is something uh, to keep in uh, mind when uh, designing the battery pack and something industry as a whole can probably think about. And I went a little bit further and did a thought experiment as to how feasible would it be pulling uh, this battery module from an edge. So you have seen this uh, 2D image before. Uh, w being the space between two modules, L is the length of the battery, H is the height, and it's being pulled from the edge. Uh, it will move cert certain distance, let's say X, at an angle theta before it hits a neighboring module. And my question was that how much it actually moves? Um, what is this X just before it hits the, this uh, housing wall or the uh, battery module, uh, another battery module? 
So um, if I do um, assume some uh, dimensions um, similar to the shoe box dimensions that we had, uh, length of 40 centimeter, this height of 20 cent centimeter, and assuming that there is a five millimeter gap, five millimeter, very small gap between the neighboring modules, uh, then what will be this angle theta before uh, this uh, module hits another module? Um, if there is a space of five millimeter, the theta is 1.4 degrees. And for the length of this 40 centimeter, there will be a lift of 10 millimeter at least from the other edge. Now the question arises, how much is the displacement in all these vertical pull-offs, especially when moving from the edge? So in all the testings that I have done, it's usually between 0.3 to 0.6 millimeter for one inch by one inch uh, surf, uh, area, surface area. Um, if I translate that into uh, what, what is this angle theta of uh, displacement, then that angle theta at 0.6 millimeter displacement is uh, 1.4 degree. And if you remember from the previous slide that 1.4 degree corresponds to that five millimeter gap between the battery modules. So that, that's an interesting thought experiment uh, just to see that if there is at least a five millimeter gap, then theoretically there is a possibility to lift the battery from the edge once it de-adheres from the gap filler, then it can be removed vertically. That will considerably reduce the vertical pull-off. And we are happy to work with any, any customer who is willing to uh, look into this approach. So at this point, I would like to conclude uh, this talk. Um, there are few takeaways, and I would like to emphasize upon them. First and foremost is that we need a efficient rework solution not only for environmental uh, sustainability, but also there is a lot of uh, um, cost involved in having an entire battery pack that is uh, thrown away. Uh, secondly, vertical pull-off, uh, even as low as 0.1 megapascal can be equivalent to lifting a single full-grown horse. So we need solutions to reduce that vertical pull-off. Uh, rough surface uh, increases the vertical pull-off. So not only the material, but also the surface properties affect what kind of uh, pull-off stress uh, you will be seeing. And uh, not only the surface, but also the testing conditions. So if we decrease the pull rate, uh, pull pull-off stress decreases. If we increase the bond gap, pull-off stress decreases. So those are also some things that can be looked into. And the most, most important thing is that if there is a way around to pull the battery from the edge, then that reduces that uh, vertical pull off quite considerably. So um, at this point, I would like to end this uh, talk. If you have any questions, um, feel free to ask me right now. You can also email me at this ID. If I don't know the answer, um, I'll forward your question to someone else. Keep an eye out for the uh, white paper based on the reworkability study that you have seen uh, today uh, that will be, we'll be releasing very soon. At this point, I would also like to acknowledge some of my coworkers who helped me in putting all of this together. Um, and I open the floor to questions.